Yes. Okay, um, now I will take you through a topic which rests quite strongly on this more modern economic growth theory. <coughs> so I'm trying to say something about how all this theory now is about to be implemented in, in let's say, more practical analytical work. We are still a bit away from, uh, let's say, applying, let's say, uh, standardized values for wider economic impacts into the cost-benefit analysis framework that we use when we analyze transport infrastructure investment projects. If you remember back to lecture number two, I, <coughs> I, I took you through this framework of cost-benefit analysis, which we normally use when we, when we uh, examine projects. Wider economic impacts is by some researchers put forward as a way of correcting the cost-benefit analysis with these positive effects of increased size of economic systems. And when we talk about impacts here, we mean specifically productivity effects, net productivity effects for the society. And we measure productivity by means of differences in wage levels. Because we say that in a well-functioning labor market, the gross wage level is what the companies are willing to pay for, a, for, a, for the workforce. So that is the wage that, that the worker gets, plus taxes. So when we talk about wider economic impact, we talk about uh, actually an adjustment in the value of time that we use in, in transport analysis. So, but, but we talk about also the external effects in a way that uh, we also consider the, the productivity effects for the industry in the area at large, meaning also those who do not use this transport infrastructure. We are also talking about the benefits for all the non-users that are part of the, let's say, they are participating in the economic system, they benefit from, let's say, reduced costs, increased wages, without necessarily being users of the transport system. So it's a, it's a very complex story, but uh, in, in, in Norway, it's been very focused uh, in connection with the main highway going from Stavanger to Trondheim, in, involving a lot of uh, fjord crossings. And, and researchers have been, uh, have been contracted by the Norwegian Public Roads Administration to work with these wider economic impacts. And uh, the main report that has been used actively to promote all these big, expensive fjord crossings is heavily discussed by the, by the rest of the research community. And I'll show you why in a while. So <coughs> I will talk about uh, wider economic impacts, what they are and how we can identify them. Uh, I will uh, say a bit about uh, some findings. And there will be findings both here and after this uh, more theoretical uh, explanation of what can go, what can take place in urban areas. And then a, then a summary. I might go on a bit beyond uh, 15 sharp, but I hope that's okay. Uh, <coughs> so <coughs> we recognize the mechanisms here. But the possibility is a cooperate. Reference to endogenous growth. 
learning effects. Reduce costs upstream and downstream, which, uh, which relates to, to new economic geography. And please note that the way transport infrastructure is funded may affect these effects. If you then build a fixed link and uh, levy a high user charge, you may not, not get much wider economic impacts in terms of these effects out of that project. So, benefits not included in an ordinary CBA framework, cost-benefit analysis framework, uh, because this framework doesn't take into account changes in productivity over time. It's, it's calculates, it says that wages, for instance, they are supposed to increase with the CPI, consumer price index. So they will increase, but only with the change in consumer price index. Whereas the wider economic impact says that, well, it will increase with the consumer price index, but also with a real growth, which is related to increased productivity in the area. <coughs> so we try to, we, we focus here on the, on, the, on the effects in the labor market. And uh, the effects in the labor market will, in turn, result in all the nice uh, scale effects and the attractivity of the region and better or cost reductions and so on. Sharing of workforce. I ended last session with the uh, labor market effect, labor pooling, which is directly related to this learning which is uh, about uh, the effects in, uh, in uh, endogenous growth, and matching, which is something which is a bit new. And that has to do with when the size of the economic system increases, the probability of finding work that matches with your competence or matches better with your competence is higher. So if you choose to work in a bigger city, the, the, the likelihood of getting a, what you might call a good job, which is sort of fits well with your, uh, with your interests and your competence, is higher. So <coughs> the sharing can be elaborated a bit. Sharing of... Uh, of uh, uh, then we have this uh, enlargement of uh, markets and labor, which we know from last session. Scale effects and so on. Uh, these can also be valid for generic use, meaning, for instance, if you improve, uh, let's say, the education system in a bigger system, refer to the debate about uh, bigger units in the Norwegian higher education sector these days. <coughs> it might be, it, some might think that that may, may be good. Others, are, like me, are a bit more skeptic, but that's another story. Um, <coughs> but again, these price effects, larger product variety, uh, which, which may be uh, then the, the result here. The other two, learning and matching. <coughs> you know this from uh, economic growth theory. Uh, the attractiveness, increasing the size of the area. Matching, as I said. And better matching will then perhaps give you, as employees, a higher wage because you are more productive. So the likelihood of getting a job with a higher wage may be larger in a, in a bigger city than Molde, for instance. And that is, uh, the, let's say, the workings of this, this mechanism. Uh, <coughs> we have seen some, um, some so in some cases, uh, I will present more uh, cases of the, in, the, in, a, in a short while. 
but we have seen some st uh, strong effects of uh, improved rail systems in the, in the UK. UK is a, if historically UK is in uh, Great Britain, England, has a very strong history on, on, on rail transport. And they have done some uh, high-speed rail uh, improvements uh, or semi-high-speed rail improvements between London and some of, uh, of the bigger cities outside. Where uh, one researcher, which I, uh, which I happen to know, which is called, he is called Daniel Graham, has uh, done some nice, very nice studies on this system. And he has uh, published uh, quite some work on this, which indicates a quite high uh, amount of wider economic impacts because of these productivity effects. But those studies are also <coughs> encumbered with some weaknesses, which we'll, I'll show you afterwards. Norway had one study which uh, gave us a result that it was a 20% increase in benefits from fixed fjord links and rather strong traffic growth in some recent pro projects. But we have done, there have done more studies after this, but this was the first one and uh, I happen to be responsible for it. Uh, so this 20% increase in benefits was, uh, was included in the cost-benefit analysis framework some, uh, some, some years ago. But there are more, as I will show you afterwards. I can show you one very short example, which we have started to, to work with. And this is um, a project connecting uh, two smaller places to a, uh, an industry cluster which is located here, which are, uh, they are doing uh, shipbuilding, specialized vessels, whereas <coughs> these areas have hospital, uh, ha has a hospital and a university college and uh, the idea here was that, that uh, in the first place, before this project was built, the promoters of the project said that it is very important for this area to recruit good people in this business, to have a complementary labor market and a very good connection to a complementary labor market. Which was deemed then to be, let's say, activities within public sector, uh, within the public sector, like uh, healthcare and uh, and education, and it goes without saying that they are thinking about uh, a certain division of, uh, let's say, gender uh, or attractiveness to 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 different workplace types of workplaces depending on whether you were a male or female, right? So this was the argument put forward by, by one of the managers of one of the big shipyards. So he was an old guy and he said that, well, the, <coughs> the, the spouses, they should work here and be able to commute and then the engineers should, which were male then of course, should work with shipbuilding, which is in his opinion was the real jobs public sector or something. Shouldn't bother too much with that. I met him and uh, <coughs> it struck me that, well, hmm, yeah, strange, some strange viewpoints, but he was very strong, a very strong character, it's Ila Ulstein, and he, uh, he, uh, he was very much in favor of this project. Actually he said that if it's not built, I'll move the whole business to Scotland. So it was built. It's the Axon <coughs> fixed link. And now researchers are, uh, are then like ourselves are interested in this. Was he right? Was there, uh, has there been any significant labor market effects, productivity effects from this, this type of thinking? Or could we say that most of the impacts from this project is captured through an ordinary cost-benefit analysis? 
And then we need to start somewhere and try to, 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 to collect some numbers. Here is one example. This is average annual daily traffic. 2008 was the first year of opening. It opened, this fixed link opened in February 2008. And we see the jump in traffic from 800 up to 1700. So at the outset, we might say that this is an indication of increased economic activity, much more movements of people to and from. Uh, the uh, Public Roads Administration, they said that this is an unexpectedly high growth. We, didn't, we were not able to capture that in our calculation models. So this is obviously a case where there are wider economic impacts. Because this activity level, the boost in activity level, has been much higher than we have foreseen at the outset before we got this project on the air. So a big jump. And this is a similar picture from the airport, because these two communities on the mainland has an airport. And we see also the jump in air traffic at the same time. So we tried to find out what is the nature of these changes. And we started by dis discussing this, this illustration here. And we found out that at the same time as the tunnel, because this is a subsea tunnel, at the same time as it opened, the airline serving this airport increased the number of departures to Oslo. I didn't think they doubled it, but it was not far from it. It was a very strong increase. So then, what is the causes and the effects here? Because we know from other types of research that if, if, you, if you increase the frequency of a scheduled transport system, it generates demand in its own sake without any, it's a pure transport cost issue. It has nothing to do with wider economic impacts. So that was the first observation that we did. And the next thing that we found out that we were going to, to investigate was that if we now use our transport modeling, uh, transport modeling system that we have developed here and try to see whether we can backcast the traffic. You need to be a bit creative when you do such research. Do you know what I mean by backcasting? That is, if we have if we have this situation, and if the transport model, the the, the model which is a mathematical model, which uh, uh, calculates how much traffic should be on a given transport network, given that the, the shape of the network and the composition of the traffic, business traffic, leisure traffic, heavy goods vehicle, light vehicles and so on, lots of data involved in this. And if the models are able to replicate the current situation, which is something like this, with around 1900 vehicles per day. And then if we use the model, and in the model we can actually remove the fixed link and introduce a ferry service. And we can see if the model gives what type of, what level of traffic will be the result if we try to use the model, let's say the other way around, to predict the situation as per yesterday. And the model, without any wider economic impacts or anything, 
hit the bull's eye, so to speak. It was spot on. So we concluded that in this case, at least in the short run, because this project has not been around for more than now seven years, it doesn't seem to be much of wider economic impacts here. Because the traditional transport model, which is based on the same logic as the cost-benefit analysis, at least uh, uh, you can actually use them for, a cost, for, for doing a cost-benefit analysis, predicts exactly the volumes that we see here. It was not popular by the, by the Public Roads Administration, I think. So this is how it looks like, this, this model. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the stream on the fixed link. It says 800 and uh, something here and 800 and something here. This is the traffic in each direction, which uh, sums up to uh, around 1700 vehicles per day. And this is the blue is the situation without the fixed link, but with the ferry situation. And there are some numbers here as well, but I, I will I just say that so the thickness of the line gives the volumes and uh, it fitted well with, with these volumes. This is a situation where we are a bit we are a bit curious about this because this is without tolls on this link. Because this link used to have, have tolls until last year. So the, the model predicts that the traffic will more than double itself after the, fixed, the, the, the road tolls are removed. It remains to be seen whether that will be the case. Uh, we, we don't know yet because uh, the tolls have been, been removed for not many months. But, uh, so, so we don't know. But anyway, the model also predicts a significant traffic growth based on the removal of the, of the tolls. So these are, this traffic is, they are doing short travels to and from these areas here and out to the, the islands. So removing of a toll of around 80 Norwegian kroner, I think it was, per trip matters for the, for the users. And this is just uh, <coughs> the yellow areas are the number of daily commuters to and from or between different communities. These are the communities on the mainland side uh, and these are the communities on the, sorry, from, from here and down to here, the, the five on the top here, is our communities on the island side. Whereas these two are communities on the mainland side. So this, this, this yellow matrix is the number of commuters going between these communities. So we see that it increased from uh, 100 and up to 300 after the fixed link was built. So in terms of daily commuters, the model predicts actually that it mattered more to get the fixed link than to get the removal of the tolls. Which says something about the price elasticity here, which is lower for commuters than for, let's say, leisure travels. Because when you remove the tolls, you can go, it costs not much, much more than the petrol to go on trips <coughs> to visit friends or relatives or whatever. So, but the point is that we use commuting as an indicator of increased economic activity. So why we bothered with commuting was to see whether it was a significant increase. In percent, the increase is, as you see, it's quite significant, but in absolute numbers, 
it's not much. You wouldn't even notice if we studied Oslo or perhaps even Molde. I mean, this change will be within, let's say, natu natural variation. It will not mean much. This is a bit more interesting and it can say something about possible longer run effects. This is the annual change in population. A decline and then in 2008 an increase in growth per year. And you can say, wow, this is really something. But then, the thing is that in the year 2008 and onwards, the conditions for the shipbuilding industry became very, very strong, dependent on let's say, global demand for, for vessels. Whereas from 2000 and up, it has been not that strong. So when we started to dig into the statistics, we found out that the growth in population had to do with, in, to, to, to quite some extent, hired workforces, work, uh, hired workers from Poland who was needed to support the big growth in, in demand for ships. Which could have taken place any, any way without any connection to this fixed link as such. It was due to the business cycles in the, in the shipbuilding industry. So I'm just saying this to illustrate the complexity and the need to go deeply behind the numbers to be able to draw robust conclusions when we address the issue of uh, economic growth and uh, wider economic impact as a consequence of transport infrastructure investments. Now on to the uh, to, to bit more complex illustrations. This is a an urban system with uh, a wage gap, which is the wage gap, and this is just a theoretical uh, illustration. The size is not important here, but what is important is that this is the wage difference between the central business district and so and the uh, and the um, let's say surroundings so if you compare a central business district with the regions surrounding this city the logic is that there is a wage gap you earn more money in the central business district so <coughs> What you would like to do, if you live around this city, in somewhere around uh, a central business district with high wages, you would like to commute to earn more money. And you would, will continue to commute, and this is uh, the number of workers that you can add on to the workforce in this economic system. And you can add on a number of workers and you can translate that in your mind to distance from the city center. You will try to commute until you reach an equilibrium where the commuting costs equals the wage difference. So you can just consider this as a very simple economic system. You have a CBD, Central Business District, and you have a surrounding region. You will commute from the surrounding region and into the 
central business district until you have reached this equilibrium point. And at this equilibrium point, you have added a number of workers to the workforce that are interested in working in the central business district. I mean, you see that every day. People commute to and from. They live outside the city centre and they commute. But they will stop commuting when the distance becomes very long. And some will start to commute if the commuting costs are reduced. So when, uh, if you have used a car or a bus uh, in this city and you have gone to Andalsnes to take the train, for instance, to Oslo, you are passing a subsea tunnel. This subsea tunnel shifted the transport costs down like this and the number of workers that was added to the workforce of this city increased a bit. In practice, an island outside of Molde was included in the workforce of Molde, perhaps to, to, a, to a larger extent, because of this reduction in, in, in transport costs. It's easier to commute, and you can then add a few more workers to the workforce. The point is, how do we address or assess this change in terms of uh, analyzing the benefits for the society? And then we are interested in the reduction in commuting costs, which constitutes of a change in driving costs, vehicle operating costs, time costs, and so on. And we get alpha is this triangle, which is the benefits for the existing commuters, the commuters that already uses this system. And you get beta, which is the net benefits for the new comers, the ones that start to commute because of the lower commuting costs. And this is the costs of, uh, of commuting, so that is, uh, that is a cost that... Uh, so the whole rectangle here is the, is the value of this extra commuting, but you have, a, uh, you have a certain cost, so then we remain with the beta as the net benefit to society. You buy this one. This is a traditional, that this is what we do in a traditional cost-benefit analysis. We actually consider uh, the change in, in, in commuter costs and we study the value of time and the value of well, the costs of, of driving and, and we calculate the net benefits and then we include alpha plus beta in the cost-benefit analysis. It is done like this. And this is explaining what I have said. So I don't <coughs> spend much, uh, much time on this. This is net benefits from the expansion of the workforce, or this, what you might call the city expansion. And this is the direct cost savings for the existing citizens or the existing commuters, if you like. But we can assume that the, the, the constant wage gradient that we have here, this may not be the real situation. Maybe the wage gradient is not constant, but it is increasing with the size of the economic system. Because that is what we have learned from new economic geography and uh, endogenous growth theory, that increased Size means better productivity because of all the mechanisms that we have discussed. And then we get a different picture. We get this picture. This is now, instead of the flat wage difference, we get a wage difference that increases with the added number of workers. So 
and this is only again a theoretical illustration. Don't bother with the shape of this curve. It may look, it may be flat or it may be sharp, but the point is that as we include an increased number of workers, the differences in wage starts to increase because of this these agglomeration effects that we have discussed. This is the same change in the commuter cost as we studied earlier here, because we improved the transport system. But because of this increasing shape of the wages, well, of the, of the wage uh, difference between the center and the periphery, and, and that the difference, the wage difference will increase because of this, uh, with distance, or it will increase with the number of workers that we include in this system, because of the nice uh, agglomeration effects. We get this as before for the existing commuters, we get this area, as before, for the newcomers. But in addition, we get this delta, which is the increase in the overall wage level for the whole economic system, because of the productivity increase for the whole system, based on this illustration that I had on the, on the scale effects and the demand effects and the cost effects with the corresponding reduction in prices, increase in productivity, and so on. So the difference, <coughs> as compared to the conventional framework, is this delta. And you have a small effect of, because of the, 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 the wage that the, that the wage level is dependent on the number of workers, workers commuting to this, uh, within this urban area. The change n plus dn is slightly larger than in the, in the previous panel. So what we actually are trying to do now, and we are also working with estimating the effects of, uh, of uh, increased size of the economic systems, meaning the, the net change of in, in wider economic impacts, um, is, uh, it's, it's, it's actually the size of this delta that is the issue at stake when we talk about wider economic impacts. Because it affects the productivity in the whole, whole economic system. This is what I have said, just just an elaboration of the figure, so I, will, I won't uh, add more on to that. This is what we get in the cost-benefit analysis, but these effects are slightly different from an ordinary cost-benefit analysis because of the agglomeration effects. So then I will spend some 10 to 15 minutes on what we actually have learned from research on the wider economic impacts. And this has been going on not for a very long time. I would say that the main, the main research effort has not been going on for more than 7 to 10 years. It is not a very long time for this type of research, which is, as I have hopefully been able to say to you, it's quite complex. And some problems that we run into when we are going to do such kind of uh, studies is that wage differences can also be due to different industry structures between regions independent of the transport system, of course. So we cannot just study wage differences and say this is wider economic impacts. They can be due to differences in the capital base, 
because a, a labor, <coughs> let's say two, two workers can be, the difference in productivity can be widely different. But it's not due to, uh, let's say, the worker uh, itself, but it can be due to the capital base. I mean, the high wages in the oil and gas sector is due to that factor, that the capital base is very strong. A lot of capital behind each work hour. Uh, <coughs> migration of productive workers to densely populated areas. I mean, if people move from Molde to Oslo, or from uh, this chip building cluster to Oslo, they may cause these benefits for the areas where these people m are moving from. So we are, we are interested in the net effects. And this is a kind of a sorting effect. Because productive workers may have preferences for urban areas that has nothing to do with let's say, the quality of the transport system, but it may, may be because they have different preferences for other types of activities that are present in urban areas. So we have this sorting effect that, I mean, this, if you have two effects going on at the same time, migration, one is because of uh, improved transport, another is because of something completely different, like uh, what is listed here, you need to separate them. Otherwise, you double count and you overestimate the level of the wider economic impacts. So we need to, <coughs> we need to understand the nature of these effects. What causes, what are the causes and what are the effects here? And we can go through some empirical findings. And if you want me to, I can post these, uh, these papers, uh, not as a part of the, um, of the curriculum, but maybe if some of you are, are particularly interested, you can, just, you can just tell me and I will, uh, I will uh, supply you with this, uh, these articles. This one <coughs> is, uh, is very, has had a quite large influence on, on the research because they have they have separated the sorting effect uh, in a way because they, they found, find out that 70% of wage differences between regions are due to industry structure and different skills, not the density as such. Density counts for around 30% of these differences. And here come some numbers that are useful because we can measure the change in wages when density increases with 1%. So if we increase density, that may be, for instance, uh, the number of heads per square kilometer. So if we increase density with 1%, they estimated, corrected for this, an impact of 0.02 percent in productivity increase. And, if you, and then you can start calculating this, uh, collecting wage numbers from the, from the National Bureau of Statistics, and you can actually calculate in euros or kroner or whatever the value of this. If you ignore this effect, you will have, a, have an, an elasticity of near twice this, uh, this 0 0.02. So density in this case means that for a given travel time we can cover a larger populated area. And that is exactly what is shown here. Because this is the equilibrium point where you are willing to commute to compensate for, for the wage difference between the center and the periphery. In the UK, this is uh, by, by Dan Graham. <coughs> he, uh, 
he did a very interesting study where he tried to break down this elasticity on various industry sectors. And then you are starting to approach a level where you can try to consider transferring elasticities between different regions. Because here we are, we have manufacturing, construction, personal services and business oriented services. And please note this one. <coughs> this, these are the lawyers, the consultancies and uh, all the people that are working in a very high, high wage sector. The benefits of connecting those people together is significantly higher than the other ones. So, but in total, we are talking about a 10 to 30 percent, I said 40, but I think it's nearer to 30 percent of added benefits of this linking of cities together, linking British cities to London in this case. The travel time savings of between 20 minutes and one hour because of these high-speed rail projects. But here the sorting effect is not taken into account, so the numbers are probably on the high side. Then this study of the remote parts of the UK, namely Scotland, where uh, James Laird, <coughs> who will give a seminar, master seminar, in the coming fall, as he did last fall, he said that even in remote areas with not many people living, even there you may get some wider economic benefits, but not related to the size of the economic systems, but to this one monopolist supplying things at a very high price, subjected to competition, and then you may have an impact of that of up to 60% in addition to the traditional cost-benefit results because the prices will shift downwards, the cost curve will shift downwards. You don't get the demand effect, but you get the cost effect in this system. If you remember back to the, the, the illustration that I showed you, before the break. Then Norway. Some studies have uh, used, made use of the British elasticities and just applied them to corresponding sectors in Norway. These, sect these elasticities which I showed, which I showed you uh, three or four slides ago. Um, <coughs> And then another approach is to compare areas with commuting distance of, say, one hour between them. What if the worst performers, say, the lowest wage level industries, could approach the best performers with the highest wage level, where wage is a proxy for labor productivity? In my opinion, this make not particularly much sense, but uh, there have been studies made. Then you have the difference in difference, which we are working with here. We will try to actually use a method from, uh, from medical research. We will try to find areas with and without large transport uh, investments and compare them. And then, finally, I will not show a study on this one because it's, uh, it's brand new, so I haven't been able to, uh, to, to, uh, to present it, but it is actually done by a PhD student of mine who has modelled the Oslofjord area with and without a fixed link crossing the Oslofjord uh, some 80 kilometres south of Oslo. 80 to 90 kilometers south of Oslo. And this uh, model is very advanced. Uh, in principle, it tries to do on each industry sector level the same, let's say, uh, estimates of elasticities as they have done in the UK. 
And he f I think he found a, an added benefit of a fjord crossing across the Oslo fjord, which actually links rather big labor markets together, rather big ones. I think it was in the area of between 0 and 7%, which is on the lower side. And that model is also taking sorting effects and things like that into consideration. This is perhaps the most influential study that has been done on this main highway between Stavanger and Trondheim. The wage elasticity, if you remember 0 0.021 from the French study, this is in the factor 5 above that one. And they have not taken the sorting effects into consideration, and they have assumed that if you if you link, let's see here, if you have a city, this is Bergen, or, it, uh, or Stavanger, south of Bergen, and then you have a labor market here, which may be Haugesund, and you link them together with a, with a fixed link. And then you link the next place, which may be a small one, and you continue all the way until you reach Bergen. So they assume that even if it is quite a long distance between Stavanger and Bergen, because of this chaining effect, you will get the benefits for all places between these two cities. And you see the objections here, uh, connected to the chaining, connecting to underlying productivity growth, with it, which would have taken place any, uh, anywhere, uh, anyhow, and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, an assessment of whether you have industries in these areas that can commute and collaborate in a meaningful way. And I'll try to be a bit blunt there, perhaps, to say that is it likely that farmers or fishermen start to commute to work together with lawyers, lawyers or consultants in the urban centre? I would say it's not, not too likely. But two cities with strong professional, let's say, environments within related industries, they may start to commute and co cooperate like uh, Graham showed for, for the UK. But they have, in a way, not discussed that in this study. And then there are uh, a couple of other studies which have, uh, have used, and, and they have also estimated, uh, their own elasticities, which is in line with the international findings of 0 0.03, which is in the middle of the two estimates from uh, France, and not too different from the, from the UK ones. So here, um, it ends up with an increase in benefits of around 4 to 5% for a case around Bergen, and between 0 and 20% uh, for a case from uh, Sogn and up north to Olsund. Zero to twenty percent, depending on on which part of the of this uh, this uh, area that is studied. They do not include the sorting effect, so uh, they are also probably on the high side. This Helm study, compared to this study, will give hundred percent increase in the benefits. So you see that uh, the reason for the skepticism is, is quite strong here. This is perhaps the most, uh, what I said, I will not call it suspect because you shouldn't call anybody's research for, 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 uh, for suspect, at least not within the same profession, but they have done this comparison of low-wage, high-wage labor markets 
and uh, assessed what if the lowest performer becomes equal to the highest performer because of the fixed link between those places. And then they end up with a report saying that these labor market effects may add three to four hundred percent to the ordinary cost benefit analysis benefits, which I think is way out of proportion. I will end now uh, with uh, this one, which is uh, something that we try to uh, do here, where we have studied comparable communities with and without transport infrastructure investments. And we get an increase in the share of commuters among the, the users of the system. And this is average of, uh, of uh, I think it's uh, four, it's five or six projects. And these are the extreme values and these are the averages. And these are, these are years in terms of time after opening. So we see that as time goes by, the share of commuters tend to increase, which is something very interesting because that may be a sign of something taking place, which is good in this area. But as you see here, it takes time. It's, I said 10 years, right? So we see that after some 10 years, things start to escalate a bit. So these are long-term effects. And this is a summary, which is I will not, uh, not uh, go much into that, but uh, just pay attention to this also. That how you fund and how you charge this, uh, the use of a transport network is also important for being able to, to get the benefits out of this. Okay. No questions? Clear or unclear? Difficult? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs>